How about you, Jack? You look like you could use a nice cold beer. You're so right. Stanley made it himself. <laughs> I strained it through a pair of Helen stockings. <laughs> Yeah, he's with this. I'm, I'm, Brand's got I'm that far. I'm that far into it. This is peanut butter. This is a local brewery, Catawba Valley. Catawba Brewing makes. It's called Peanut Butter and Jelly Time. It's peanut butter. You can taste the bread, and it's got strawberry and rhubarb in it. Oh wow! So it's like drinking a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It is amazing. <laughs> and and Dan, what do you think about that? Uh, that sounds wonderful and horrendous all at once. <laughs> <laughs> Dan's not a craft beer guy. Uh, I'm all about no. some craft beer. I was I was thinking of this call, and since you both are drummers, I started laughing in my head, imagining you guys are the typical play a bunch of fills while the guitarist is trying to tune his guitar uh, oh, yeah. pre-show. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you both have done that many a times. I used to get yelled at so bad. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys for joining me. Greatly appreciate it. Brant from In My Head does the amazing panel videos, the amazing reviews, and our other guest tonight is Dan. Infamous Dan, uh, Sweet Dan 1970. Sweet Dan. Mentioned in many of my vlogs, and this isn't going to be a typical vlog like I do. Um, I just wanted this. I'm envious, I'm envious of Dan. I want to be I want to be Rick's best friend, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this uh, this won't be like a typical vlog. This will just be kind of just a like a like a happy hour wax conversation. And what I wanted to talk about, because Brent, you and I had talked earlier this week about this record, Carnival. Oh Souls. yeah. Oh, and yeah. Uh, I wanted to kind of talk about this era in general, a live three ish era, and. My first question to you, Brant, is you love this record. And I just, I, I, I'm just curious, like, what was it about this record that, that moved you? Um, well, Carnival of Souls, uh, a, a lot of people, what they say is bad about Carnival of Souls, to me, is what makes Carnival of Souls so special. Uh, a lot of people hate it because it doesn't sound like Kiss. They say it's... They're, they're ripping off grunge era. Everybody was ripping off grunge era. I don't fault Kiss for trying to do that. Uh, I think Kiss made an amazing grunge album. They even stole Allison Chains' producer, uh, Toby Wright, I believe is his name. Mm -hmm. He'd just come fresh off of making, uh, I think, either Dirt or Three-Legged Dog. I'm a huge Allison Chains fan. Uh, I love Jerry Contrell. Um a lot of people are big Lane Staley fans. I'm a huge Jerry Cantrell, Sean McKinney. Sean McKinney is an amazing drummer, one of the most imaginative, creative drummers I've ever seen. And Eric Singer is Eric Singer's production, his his performance on Carnival of Souls is hands down his best performance on any Kiss album. Bruce Kulick, Bruce Kulick had some amazing performances on 80s albums, but his hands down best performances best songwritings is on Carnival of Souls. It's essentially almost like a Bruce Killick project album with Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley singing songs. Uh, you know how you'll have guitarists like Santana where they'll make a project album and they have guest vocalists. Mm -hmm. Every time I hear Carnival of Souls, I hear this is Bruce in his element. This is Eric in his element. And Gene and Paul are the guest singers mm. that came in and sang. Uh, and Bruce even has a song on that album, I Walk Alone, which is hands down one of my favorite songs on the album. But um, I love everything about this. I know some people have beef with it about the words. Even Paul's like, Paul wasn't a big fan of this album. Talking about, you know, we're millionaires. Why are we singing about all these depressing songs? Yeah, and Danny mentioned that today to me. 
you know, why they did what they did. But there was a lot of millionaires out there during this time that was singing depressing songs. Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains. Uh, there was a lot of bands out there. And I don't think, to me, grunge is not depressing. Uh, typo negative is depressing. Uh, but there's, a, I find a lot of therapy, me personally, my personality, my messed up in my head personality, I find listening to a depressing song comforting and it'll actually make me feel better because I hear the words to that song and I'm like, man, that dude was in a dark place. I'm better than that. So there's that. Um, but I just love Carnival Souls. It's probably hands, it's probably my top three mm. favorite Kiss albums of all time. And it's a song, there are, there are some songs on it I don't care for, but it's just a performance of that. And, and Sweet Dan being a drummer, so yeah, listen to Eric Singer on that album. He's off the chains. He's off the charts and some of the stuff. And all the, being a drummer, all the weird timing and stuff that was not always, it was kind of symbolic of grunge, but the band that did it the best was Alice in Chains. Soundgarden did it really good too, where they had these weird seven, eight measures, or they'd have a, a like Danny was talking about, a five eighths measure where they'd drop a beat, or where they'd have a seven eighths measure and then throw in a two count, or just all these weird timing changes, key changes, the weird tunings. Um, and another thing about Carnival Souls, I've said it before, and it's been on my channel, it is to me, and to my son, who's 25, turns 25 in uh, January, um, it is the most relevant Kiss album to him. He loves albums like Alive and Rock and Roll Over and Alive 2. But he said in the review that we did is Kiss could release Carnival of Souls today and it would be it would be relevant still. It doesn't it would not sound old because there's still a lot of grungish sounding music out there. But it's one Carnival of Souls is one of his favorite albums, and he's a baby Kiss fan. So to me, that speaks volumes mm -hmm. about that album. So, so Danny, you went to the '95 convention. Do you, you do you recall any talk of this record at that time? I do, uh, and that came straight from Bruce Kulick himself. Uh, before Kiss, before all of Kiss came out, you had an Eric Singer drum clinic, and then you had a Bruce Kulick guitar clinic and bruce said it, this kind of shows you the times because internet was starting to pop out but i'd say 95 that was that was probably the pinnacle of like bootleg cds and everything and uh bruce kulik's q a uh someone said do you have any new riffs you work are working on and he goes yes actually on our new album i could play you the riffs right now but I'm not going to do it because one of you is going to have a tape recorder in your hand and it's going to be everywhere before we even release the damn thing. Those are his literal words. So we oh. did not get to hear any riffs, but that was him talking about it. And then literally a week later, what's that place in Kansas City called? Seventh Heaven? Yeah. Uh, they already had Carnival Souls on bootleg and sure enough, yeah, I swiped it because... I can't remember what fanzine me and you subscribed to, Rick, but there was a lot of talk about Carnival of Souls, what the song titles were, and what it sounded like, and we were all getting jazzed up. Mm -hmm. And then to finally actually have it in my hand, even though it wasn't the best quality, was I can remember that like it was yesterday. See, and I was I remember I was twenty two and I was hugely guilty of listening with my eyes and mm -hmm. you know, or listening with huge judgment and i didn't like alternative i didn't like alice in chains i was a hair metal guy the 90s ruined a lot of the bands i liked and i i remember judging this record a lot and to me to this I day did. to this day this record feels like the elder used to to me like the the way the elder felt to me in high school I still feel that way with this record, but I respect it a lot more than I did when I was young. 45-year-old yes, 40, me is different than 25-year-old me. Uh, uh, I, do, I, would, I would put the album in my top 10 of Kiss albums. Uh, if someone came up to me and said, hey, you like this band Kiss, what do they sound like? This would probably be 
the number one album that I would not play <laughs> for them because it doesn't sound like the Kiss that we know and love, per se. Kind of like Unmatched doesn't sound like mm -hmm. the Kiss we love, but we both we love both albums anyway because it's Kiss. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with Brant. Uh, Eric Singer shines on this album. Um, just yeah, those great fills, great time changing, all that kind of stuff. Um, I remember seeing a you can get actually an instructional video that's out there probably on YouTube now. He teaches you how to play the hate beat, which is not an easy beat to play. And uh, uh, the way I see this album now, um, I love the riffs. I love the sound. I, I love the first, I'd say, four or five songs. After that, it starts to lose me. And I honestly couldn't probably even, except for In My Head and um, the I Walk Alone, I would not be able to tell you any of the other titles. Yeah, on it, that album. I, it loses me after In My Head. It, I'm really, and that's why I wanted to have this call because even Brant talking today, I know I'm going to go listen to it differently now. You know, sometimes you have to have that voice of reason <laughs> out there. That, that's what I get from the panel a lot, Brant, is um, I'll hear someone's take on a song and I'll think, wow, and then I'll go back and I'll listen to the song again and it's different. That's why my first question to you was, what sucked you into this record? And I know I'm going to go listen to it differently now. I was listening to it before we, we talked tonight. Master and Slave is a great, great song. Mm -hmm. I'd not heard much about this album until it came out. It was I wasn't I wasn't really looking forward, and I didn't hear the bootleg. And I remember when it came out, I remember being in the record store, and we had this record store we used to go down to uh, called the Record Bar, and there was this hot-ass um, uh, person that worked there. She used to be a stripper, and, uh, and she was just hot, and we'd just go in there just to Google at her first. But I remember I walked in and she'd always, she knew what was up. She knew what I liked. And I'd come in and she'd be like, hey, I got the new kiss. And I'm like, the makeup? She's like, I, I unplugged? Or she's like, you know, no, the, their, new, their, new, their new Carnival album. And I was like, oh, okay. And I remember going out, I remember getting the CD and going out in the car and putting it in. And it's starting up with, with hate. And... I remember thinking, sitting there in my car, I had a I had a, an Eclipse at the time, and it had like a twelve hundred dollar stereo system in it, of course, because all cars did back then. And uh, I remember blasting that going down the road, and almost got pulled speeding um, because that that song, man, don't listen to that song when you're driving mm -hmm. because it is just it has that power to it, and there's a lot of songs on there that have so much power. If you want to hear something really cool, it's very short, but it's where Eric Singer shines. And I'll tell you, Rick, and I know uh, Sweet Dan knows what I'm talking about, is on um, on the uh, Bruce Killick song. It's pretty docile. The song's pretty docile all the way through, and I love the, the way it builds. And if you listen to it with a musician's ear, it builds and builds and builds. And then it gets into that part where it goes into the solo and the drums are played backwards. They they it's yep. a backwards track on the drums. And then it goes into that. He says something. Then it goes into that heavy guitar riff. It goes da na 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 da na na. It's the only thing doing it. And then Eric does this triplet thing where he is he does a triplet is three notes. So it's like the first one he hits with a hand the second one with the foot, the third one with the hand, and then somewhere in there he alternates to where it flips over to where it's the bass on the first, a hand on the second, and then a bass on the third. And he just is going down his kit. It's before it busts back into where um, Bruce and Gene come in going, and I know deep inside of me that if that right there is the price of admission for me for that whole album. Just that little 30-second. Hmm. Now I know what I'm going to listen to as soon as we hang yep. this call up. Exactly. Listen to that, man. And when you exactly. hear it, just appreciate just that little, about four bars of Eric just going to F off. Hmm. And, hmm. And, and the technicality, if that's a word behind what he's doing. I've sat and I've drawn it out, listened to it. 
put it in a program, slowed it down, trying to hear individually what he's doing. And just that little stuff right there, he shows the kind of drummer he is in just that one little spot. That, that See, and that's what I wanted out of this. I, I wanted sparks of fire, you know, sparks of, well, sparks of magic, you know. Uh, speaking of uh, hate, so me and a few buddies uh, decided to start a new band I was kind of the, the last player in this thing because uh, my buddy Todd said, well, if we're going to do this, I want to bring my da- my friend Dan in because I've been wanting to start a band with him. And they're like, okay, Dan can sing a couple of these songs. Uh, what's what's Dan's list of songs he wants to do? And, of course, they all know I'm a big Kiss fan, so they knew what was coming. And, you know, and I picked some T-Rex, some, oh, uh, I can't even remember what else was on there, some weird obscure stuff because we're trying to stay away from your common top 40 rock hits but of course what kiss song did i pick i picked hate out of any kiss song i pick i picked hate that's awesome uh, brant i know you'll know what i'm talking about instantly towards the beginning of the song when uh man was created in the image of Ah! Uh, goosebumps when i hear that yeah that little quick at the very beginning it's just awesome it's just and that reminds me so much of kind of Sean Kenny type stuff, but sped up. Um, yeah. a, a real heavy Sean Kenny sounding type thing there. And uh, I will admit I'm a more of a fan of Gene's songs on this album. Uh, yeah. But Paul has, Gene has some stinkers. Paul has um, <laughs> some sh- some uh, songs that really shine. I love Rain. A lot of people don't like Rain because they're expect, because Allison Chain has a song called Rain When I Die. And whenever he, but but Paul Stanley's vocals on Rain, when he brushes into that first twisting like a hurricane, I yeah. mean, oh my God! And when he's when I'm going rain, he drops down. It's like that is the Paul. That is the Paul that I know and love. And um, the song on there that he wrote for his son um, Evan, um, I'll be there. That's just amazing to me. The guitar work in it and Paul's vocals in it. That's just an amazing song too. So I know Paul complained a lot about writing about depressed stuff and Paul was really out of his skin on this album and, and we were perfectly in Gene's skin. Um, but Paul found a way to um, he found a way to still be Paul. And I respect him for that. He put on solid performances on everything that he did. And just those two songs alone, Rain and uh, Jungle is good, too. Jungle's too long for me. I don't like the whole thing going on at the end, but that was kind of a grungish 90s type thing, too, where they did that. They borrowed heavily from Alice in Chains on that. And, I mean, I guess I love this album so much, like I said, because I'm a huge fan of of Alice in Chains. I'm I'm not a big fan of the grunge era, and I do not consider... um, I think we lost Dan. Yeah. But... Dan? Are you receiving me? Come in, please. Over. Hello, Houston. Hawaii. We've lost our radio contact. We've also lost him on the scope. First off, Brent has this record on album, which is cool. I didn't... Have you have yeah. you opened it or is it on a is it sealed? Uh, it's oh, sealed. I haven't seen that on album. I know, me neither. Um, was that a sound of vinyl or a record store? No, it, it's no, it's a 2014. It's part of the 2014 reissues. Um, I've got a live three on vinyl, mm. and I've got I've got Carnival Souls wow. on vinyl. I bet and they're I bet. both. I bet that sounds delicious. Oh, I'll know one day when I open them. <laughs> one thought I had when you guys were talking earlier. I knew you could bring that album up. I, these two records are very similar to me. Like, they both have the same feel. Like, it's both, both bands that have a certain sound. They change it mm-hmm. almost completely. And Try to stay current. And, but like Brant said, it, you know, even though I'm not, I, I need to warm up to this record a lot, but like Brant said, and I believe you said too, Dan, 
you could play this record today and it would sound current. You know, I think so. Yeah, and and I I totally think it's the same thing with this, this Motley Crue record. Yeah, this I've this heard a lot record. of people. I've heard a lot of people say that that's their favorite Motley Crue record. Mm-hmm. Uh, like. I won't say that, but it is hands down my favorite Tommy Lee drum record. Oh, totally. That's, yeah. So, how how much do you guys love the era of Bruce, Eric, Singer, Gene, and Paul? I love. It. I that that's the era I want back. Yeah, uh, that's when like like if I were to if I was a twenty something and I wanted to start a band today. And I, you know, if I was out in LA or New York, I, I would even to the point that that's how I'd want my band to look because it doesn't have the 80s glam cheese that was getting old by 1989, 90 that Nirvana killed off. Um, it doesn't, but it doesn't have that death metal y or grungy, you know, I just got off work look at the same time, which I can't stand that either. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's how a rock band should look. Still larger than life. Didn't doesn't need to make up uh, a top of their game as far as their instruments individually. Mm-hmm. My thoughts on that is if you take the um, I love well I love Asylum. Um, I'm not and I will li- I will self admit and Rick knows this as, as to be fact since he's known me for a couple of years now. I'm not the biggest fan of the next two albums after. Um, I had never. When I when I bought cra- uh, Crazy Nights on vinyl recently, I saw it in a record store and I bought it. It's the first time I've ever owned it. Mm. Um, and Hot in the Shade, I went and saw that tour and didn't even had not even heard any of the songs off the album. I listened to it on the way to the show. I loved the show. Awesome, awesome tour, awesome concert. Hot in the Shade was. Um, the album is hit and miss very much um, for me. But to me, Kiss, what they were. That 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 band of Kiss, it morphed a lot, especially when we got Singer into the play. Um, Kiss on Revenge with me was about, and I know I may piss some seventies Kiss bros off, and you guys have to remember I'm a seventies Kiss bro too, so don't throw anything at your TV screen, tablet, whatever you're, you know. Um, but to me. At that point in time where they were, taking the 70s aside, at that point in time where they were, Kiss was about to, Revenge album was as close as they can come to being a legit heavy metal rock and roll band as they had ever came. Revenge, that era, that tour, that album, that look, that sound, that feeling, that camaraderie that they had on stage, still four professional dudes. I'm sorry I'm not a Tommy Thayer fan, but just that feel that those four guys had is close to a legit rock and roll band, heavy metal band, as they're going to get. And the reunion trashed it. And they never went back. To me, after the reunion was done and after the farewell was done, you son of a bitch. <laughs> they, they should have took the makeup off. They should have took the makeup off and went and got Bruce back and went back to doing that. It wasn't too far removed. They were still in the '90s, late '90s. But I would have loved to hear what what a what if a Bruce Kulick, Eric Singer, Paul and Gene non makeup album would have sounded yeah. in place of Sonic Boom. Uh, it I think Sonic about that. Yeah. Um, if anything, Carnival of Souls will go in history as the last Kiss album where they tried their best to be a current non uh, not capitalizing on their history album. They were trying to be, you know, along with the other current bands. Uh, that is the last album they did that on, and then it went back to nostalgia, which I was totally fine with, still on board for all that too. Um, uh, a lot of bands do that; they they try to go as current as they can. They realize there's no, we're not going to make any more money because at at the end of the day, especially for a band like Kiss, it let's not fool ourselves. It comes down 
to the money and they, they saw the writing on the wall and uh, I would have done the same thing if I were them, especially when you know you can go back to your 70s glory heyday and get a whole new fan base. Uh, but that's usually where the musical exploration ceases and for when you are a fan of all facets of the band that is a little saddening that you know you're not really going to get anything super fresh or um inspired per se from them it's all about the almighty dollar dollar at this point and that's what i thought i think of a lot is how cool would a bruce singer simmons stanley tour be and they would sell out small clubs without a doubt but they wouldn't make the big no. money and no and unless they make the big money i don't think they're in it that's why we'll never see another record right and, and that doesn't re- make bad guys for doing that a lot of people that's why they get so much shit today but at least kiss mm-hmm. is honest about it um at the risk of sounding controversial they yeah. they are they're old old and uh and i'm old too so i can say that but and right now they're all about taking the easy way out they're not going to try to recreate themselves they're not going to try to be creative paul stanley will be creative in his little soul what is it soul station Mm -hmm. i mean he's already said he's not interested in making any more mute any more kiss music but yet he still consider continues with his side projects and with that he's perfectly happy to go around and play small venues but when it comes to kiss it's almost like that's beneath them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that the only ki- thing Kiss would do now is maybe a Vegas re- residency, or I don't even think that they're interested in doing that. I think they're going to make what they can make off of whatever tour dates they can still do or are going to be allowed to do. And then they're going to just live off merchandising and re-releasing of albums and maybe re- maybe get creative and re-release some box sets. Because even with their reissues they're doing on their albums, they're lazy. Rick, me and you were talking about this the other day, I think, off camera. Just repressing it in a different color? I mean, fuck that. I mean, do something different. Do something creative. Release demos. Release what? books. Release pictures. And even the covers are seem to be like photos of the original artwork. Like the Hot in the Shade cover is not the same as the original pressing of the vinyl. It looks like like it's just like a, a redone photo. Speaking of Soul Station, real quick, don't mean to interrupt you, no, but uh, I have heard some of that Soul Station, and I think he should rename it uh, Corona. I'm sorry, Paul. No. Yeah, I I haven't heard it, and I'm I I can tell you I'm gonna stay far away from it. That's just not my era of music. I didn't even get into Live to Win because I did not. Hear. It seemed very Nickelbackish. I. People will probably get mad that I said that, but I just stayed away from it also. Paul actually admitted in an interview that he intent- intentionally made that album more of a Nickelback type of album, that mm. he needed to get that out of his system, and, and he did, and that's it. And m- much like the Gene, uh, what was that called, Asshole? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I bought it, first day it came out. Do I listen to it today? Not much. Uh, my friend Mike, Rick, your friend Mike, he... Uh, I remember being on the phone saying, uh, why didn't you go out and buy the Gene Simmons asshole album? And he said, that's beans. That ain't chili. <laughs> <laughs> Talking to, to you, Brant, especially, and your love for this record, made me realize tonight that if, honestly, if there would be a box set and coffee table book for a record, it should be this, in a way. Because this is mm-hmm. kind of the most, besides the elder, it's kind of the most... Outcast. <laughs> Unique. That'd be good. Yeah. Yeah, like <clears throat> mysterious record of the catalog. It is it is the bastard child. It's like they acknowledge the elder a little more than they do um than they do uh Carnival of Souls. It's like they and that's what makes me really sad is a lot of the albums that a lot of the things that I'm really proud of when it comes to KISS are things that they're not so proud of. Uh, I'm I'm proud of and I love Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park. They won't even acknowledge it. Uh, I I love The Elder. They've acknowledged it some in tours and comp and, and and some of the conventions, but but you know they won't. Uh, they don't acknowledge albums like uh, Unmasked. 
they're not playing any songs. I think Shandy, well, Paul couldn't sing it now, yeah. but I think Shandy would have been great on oh, the man. tour. Throw some, throw some stuff in there. They're so, I honestly think that it would have been good if they would have tried to find to at least one song representation off of every album, whether it was a makeup album or not, to have on the end of the road. Because if you're trying to wrap up your, your catalog, if you're trying to wrap up who you are in a closing night, who cares if somebody's going to get up and go to the bathroom? We already see in my panel videos that even somebody's favorite song or multiple people's favorite song, you're going to have people that that song is at the bottom of their list and that you can play Lick It Up. You play Lick It Up at the show. If I was at the Kiss show at the end of the Road Shore show, as soon as Paul started singing, don't want to wait till you know me better, I'd be like, I'll be back. I'm going to go piss. Because I don't care for Lick uh, I was made for loving you. Hey, there's another break for me to go get a beer. I don't care to hear those songs live ever again. Can you imagine? Uh, can you imagine how the crowd would shit, or at least half the crowd, if they started playing hate at the at a at a end of the road show? You'd have people sitting there not knowing what the fuck's going on. But by the by the by the end of the by the time they hit that power chord, that that. As soon as they hit that part going into where you wear your crown when you're lying six feet underground, as soon as they hit that part, people's heads are going to be because that is metal. That is metal. Yeah. And if you're there to see a metal show, you should appreciate a metal song. And, well, that's, uh, what, <laughs> that's what's so cool about a band that's been around so long as Kiss because, I mean, I know they chased trends, but when you once the decades pass, you can look at it from back here and you're like oh wow kiss had a disco song kiss had a grunge album kiss had a completely pop album kiss had a heavy metal album how many bands can really say that i mean i'm proud as hell of kiss and their catalog the diversity of their catalog i'm proud to say all of them right me too and you can't i mean and i love acdc but you can't say that with acdc every album you know what you're going to get you're not going to get a disco tinged acdc song and that can kind of make things a little bland. Yes, that gives you quote unquote integrity because you never strayed from what you're known for. And, uh, but when, like I said, as the decades pass and you're looking at your favorite band, you've got so much shit that you can pick for from depending on what mood you're in that day. Final question. How psyched would you guys be for a Bruce Kulik tour? Bruce with a solo band doing <clears throat> his era kiss songs i would be honestly at this point because for me i mean i love seeing the kiss spectacle in the show but you know getting ready to hit 50 it at the end of the day it's always about the songs and being a huge fan of the songs that only kiss fans know that i would pay good good money to hear bruce play those extremely obscure songs as opposed to paying 300 dollars to see just play and know what i know they're gonna play because i would i would shit my pants to hear like is that you or whatever bruce is playing i know he's going real deep deep into the vaults when he's doing this stuff i he did a, probably he did, a, to he did turn on the night yeah I, w- I mean can you imagine the goosebumps knowing you're never going to hear these songs anywhere else ever mm-hmm. except from this man but and, i'd be so uh, and dan you sent me a clip of his band on the cruise doing these songs. And Mm -hmm. that's what kind of reignited my wanting to hear this record again. Mm -hmm. Because I think that a lot to do with, we've had a couple decades now that we're separated from grunge because Rick, anybody that knows me and you knows we were not fans of grunge in any shape or form. Um, uh, I mean, I guess I kind of was, I like, I know no disrespect to your taste brand, but I, I was never an Allison Chains fan. I did love Jerry Cantrell, much like you. It was Lane Staley that, that broke it for me because I, I just never, to me, it was depressing. And I know, I know he was being real with himself and all that stuff. But you know, for me, every day could be depressing. I didn't need any help in that department. <laughs> so, well, and, mm-hmm. and my bad thing back then as a youngster was 
I judged everything. So I judged Alice in Chains as alternative. They were a metal band. I just didn't realize it. I didn't realize did. it until my fourth. And I even like, I even like, yeah, I, there was a song I just heard on the radio recently. I know they mentioned this, the word California in the song over and over again, but that it's that Jerry Cantrell riff that sucked me right in. So they've got a they've got a song that's probably a couple years old now called Stone, which is really good. Uh, Alice in Chains is one of those bands that they've managed to maintain their sound and uh, and and if you've never heard Jerry, if you're a Jerry Cantrell fan, if you've never heard his solo album he did called Boggy Depot. Oh, oh yeah. Boggy Depot is amazing. You owe yourself to look it up because Jerry, that's all Jerry Cantrell, Sean Kenny, and Mike Starr. It's basically Alice in Chains without Lane. Um, hmm. And it's and that could have been a band. Just three Alice in Chains could have been a three piece band. No disrespect to Lane. Um, I my favorite Alice in Chains album with Lane Staley on is their first date, their first album. The song Love Hate Love I think is amazing. They have Man in the Box, of course, everybody's heard. We Die Young is a great song. Uh, it ain't um, like that anymore. It ain't like that anymore, yeah. Um, Bleed the Freak, that piano at the beginning of it, and that slide guitar. Da, 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 eh. I mean, it's just great. But uh, talking about Bruce, the question you asked, Bruce's band, I would, I would go see them. I would go see them if they were playing a club or whatever. I would go. I would go just to hear. I actually did a video whenever Kiss did the Kiss Cruise, and I, I play clips from each one of those um, talking about it. And I believe it's the same clip that you're talking about, Dan. And I would love hear. I'd love hear the full versions of these songs, not just a uh, you know a melody of them, where they did one song that was like four four songs and a melody. Um, yeah, and Bruce Bruce Kulick's band is awesome. They sounds they sound awesome, and he sounds good. Mm-hmm. He to this day sounds good. You watch him on his Instagram, and he's there just playing stuff by himself and talking. He's a very personable guy, and he um, he just sounds awesome. I have a lot of admiration for him. So, but yeah, I definitely go see a Bruce Kulick and band tour. Um, and, and I, I definitely would. and and on that, I think. I could be wrong, but I really think we are on the verge of a total, like, kind of like nostalgic wave of the non-makeup era. I really mm-hmm. think, like, that's going to become, like, the cool thing all of a sudden. Like, mm-hmm. so buy your non-makeup merch now because it'll be skyrocketed one right. day. But I, I really think, like, that's that's where we're headed. We're going to head towards this. Once the end of the road's done and... <clears throat> And, you know, it's not in our face every day, like makeup, the, you know, the spaceman, cat man. It goes back to being grassroots again. Yeah, yeah. I think, mm-hmm. I think it may not be the records that are celebrated, but I think that lineup, I can see Animal Eyes Live Uncensored being like this, like, oh, have you seen that? Or like a Blu-ray release. At least mm-hmm. that's what I hope. You'll start seeing this asylum t-shirts again with the four faces on the front of it. <laughs> the hot in the shade, the hot in the shade yeah. t-shirt. Quick carnival soul story uh, that just happened maybe two weeks ago. Uh, I got a nice Bluetooth speaker for my TV, had it on uh, YouTube and was just playing all kinds of Kiss songs. Stephanie, my girlfriend, was in the other room and it started playing um, Master and Slave and... Uh, Stephanie came in, looked at the TV screen, and goes, this is Kiss? I go, yeah. She goes, I thought you were listening to Stone Temple Pilots. Because <laughs> um, in, in her uh, defense, the riff to Master and Slave is a quite a bit like, um, what was the Stone Temple Pilots song? Sex type thing. But there, wasn't, there was that, a lot of wasn't that a rip off of uh, War, War Machine? So, a lot of people so, say, yeah, but it's a full that, circle that, because that was a rip off yeah. of War Machine. Yeah, because yeah. that dun 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 dun
that is the cool thing about me and me and my son said this in our review of it. My son said my son Steven said this is one thing I like about this album is it, what a lot of people say is it doesn't sound like Kiss. I think the good thing about this album is that it doesn't sound like Kiss because <laughs> yep. that's the one thing I love about it. And you're right. It does not sound like Kiss. It's one of those albums where you can play a song and you, that may not be a song that's popular. They'd be like, who is that? That sounds like Kiss. You're not going to get that out of Carnival Souls. Hmm. If, if you're at a Kiss concert, if even if it's end of the road and you strike up a conversation with the fella or the girl next to you, and you maybe mention or hear her mention like a song from Carnival Souls, you know you've got a diehard Kiss fan because, like we both know, a good way of weeding out a, a Kiss fan versus a person who likes Kiss, you know, it, the golden rule of if they say Rock and Roll Night or Beth <laughs> are their favorite Kiss songs, you're out. <laughs> Just kind of an unwritten rule. Or, they, or they say the, the one guy with the tongue. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're like, I'd be like, so what do you think about the song Under the Rose? You like that <laughs> <Right>. song? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, man, what about I, Jungle? What about Jungle? You a big fan well, of Jungle? Well, what about that big <laughs> to Naked City? How do you top that? <laughs> <laughs> right. I appreciate you guys taking time out of your Friday night to uh, talk to me. Because now we all have our homework. And that is listen to I Walk Alone for the Eric Singer drum fill. And uh, yeah, it's amazing. It's life changing. Thank, thank you for this because <laughs> I, I don't, I don't dislike this record. I just need to warm up to it more, and it always, it always helps for me to talk to other fans. So I appreciate yeah. that. Thank you guys for hanging with me. I love talking lost sheep kiss albums, and this is a lost sheep kiss album. Yes. Give this album love. It deserves it. <laughs> I, will. I will open up open up and and alive two and alive and alive two are not the only good kiss live albums <laughs> amen amen to that i love this record i really do me too I, give uh, this one a chance give this one a chance too <laughs> brant if you've never seen it watch when gene and paul were on the howard stern show trying to promote a live three it's the weirdest interview you'll ever see with them it's a good one check that out i don't think i've ever seen it yeah it's a good oh one. yeah and it's pretty much, they're still pretty fresh from Eric Carr passing at that point. Oh, yeah. Um, it's yeah. Howard pushes them a little. Yeah, it, it, oh. gets, it gets tense there for a minute because uh, right before that interview, Howard had uh, kind of made fun of Eric Carr on the air because Eric Carr's friend called him and told him to do it because Eric Carr mm -hmm. was a Howard Stern fan. So Howard Stern was doing it kind of like a tribute and Gene found out, and it really pissed him off. And so they, it gets tense there for a minute in this interview. It's okay. Neat. But thank you guys for joining me. I really, really appreciate it. Brant does the amazing, amazing Kiss reviews. Check out his back catalog of YouTube videos. Man, just talk about in-depth reviews of records and thoughts that'll make you want to go back and listen to the record. His box set reviews will make you want to go back and listen to the box set. And of course the panel is so much fun because you hear everyone's thoughts and uh, it, it makes you want to go back and listen to these records. And that's the most important thing is hanging out in your basement, listening to these records. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I have a feeling we'll all be listening the shit out of Asylum in a, in a few days too. Oh, oh so. yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, and Dan, I have been, I have been. My list has changed three times, <laughs> so I got to, I got to finalize it tomorrow. So, and Dan, <sighs> thank you for joining me. Uh, well, I will try to step more out of my uh, social media cocoon and get yeah, more involved. Dan, in this it's good stuff. to see you finally to meet you face to face, yeah, in person at least. Uh, Dan's my, uh, you know, my everything when it comes to kiss, and I just appreciate you every day. Every day I look around my room, I. I think. My, like, my friend, my friend Scott, that's been in some videos with me. He was in. He reviewed uh, uh, Animalize with me, and he reviewed Asylum with me. This is his era too, but he's the one that I scared to death with the Gene Simmons solo <laughs> album. He was my next door neighbor, so uh -huh. I'm I'm his Dan. I mean, <laughs> he's still a friend of mine to this day. I'm his Dan, and and he's my Rick. I was the one in, introduced him to Kiss and. 
and they introduced him to music. He used to come and hang out with me when we was in my band. And I remember whenever my band Lydia's Bridge, when the bass player left, we brought him in and I've got videos I've shown it where I'm actually showing him how to tune his bass. And now he's a bass player. He's a singer. He's a guitarist. He plays in three or four different bands. And I mean, he's out there living that rock and roll lifestyle and playing to people out and playing. And he was telling me, I was talking to him just today. He's like, man, this Corona stuff sucks. I can't go out and play live. And I'm itching. I'm sitting around the house just playing to myself. He's like, I'm going crazy, man. So, and that just to hear that, that I had that kind of influence. It, it, whenever I see you and Dan, it reminds me a lot of, of me and of me and him. So yeah. his fan has a Brant, Dan, or Rick in their life. Mm-hmm. That, that needs some problems. Yeah. So. Yep. Awesome. yep, and Rick's, all, Rick's already been an influencer to people himself, so that's awesome. It's a circle, like you said. Well, thank you guys for joining me, and, uh, and let's do this again. We'll just come up with a different topic, and we'll meet and uh, do a little, little happy hour wax. Go wash your hands, boys. What are you up to, Dan? Oh, I was just to say, once I can safely go to a store again, I need to get some red food, food coloring. Do you remember this bad boy? <laughs> yes, it's that. Yes. <laughs> Grant, this thing uh, made me lose my lease at an apartment in Kansas City because I forgot it was full of blood when I lifted it, lifted it up for the move and it went all over the carpet. Oh, <laughs> and I wow. lived, I lived with him at the time. It looked like it killed a cat in that room. There was like <laughs> so much blood all over the floor. <laughs> yeah. It looks like I got lucky with a menstruating gal. So. Oh my God. <laughs> All right. All right. You boys, you boys have oh. a good weekend. Everyone watching, have a good weekend. Take care. Wash your hands. We will talk to you soon. See you. Bye bye. You son of a bitch. Bitch. <laughs> bitch. <laughs> bitch. <laughs>